Hey guys, Mike here. So another interesting week in the market we just went through and you know another jam-packed video for you when it comes to data showing that there are some headwinds for sure that you can see playing out. Again, it's going to take time, but I'm going to show you those because you need to be aware of them. And I'll guarantee you a lot of people are not, but that's what we try to do on this channel. And then we'll go into some charts, but then I'm going to show you a video because I always try to show you game within a game, stuff behind the curtain, right, that we just don't have access to and stuff. And I told you, I mean, a long time ago, you know, about Robinhood obviously selling our orders to Citadel. So they're front running our orders. They know exactly what we're buying before we even buy it and stuff. And so it gives them a huge advantage. Well, I found this interview that shows it on a much larger scale. So it's not just retail uh, getting front run. And the, uh, the amount is staggering. I had to go look the word up to see how many zeros was in this because I'll be honest with you, I didn't really think about what was past a trillion because I never had to, right? But this video shows you a little different, right? Okay, and so buckle up because let's go ahead and get started because there's a lot of stuff in this. Actually, we talk about share buybacks a lot, right? And this kind of shows that the stocks with the highest repurchases are trailing the market by a huge margin. And we think about stock buybacks, we think about Apple and the big ones, a very handful of stocks. There is many companies that do share buybacks. And so far, investors just aren't really buying into their stocks, right? And more importantly though, this is what we talked about because people are predicting share buybacks will start to slow down. This is a form of liquidity for certain stocks, right? And a lot of stocks for that matter. And you can see this goes over CapEx, R&D, dividends, and buybacks. And you can see it starts Q1 2022 and then Q1 2023. And you can obviously see as we go over whether it's CapEx, R&D, dividends, especially stock buybacks, you're seeing a huge, huge fall off from this, okay? And that will absolutely affect stocks. It'll affect the market. Hey, it'll affect the economy. We're talking about CapEx and research and development, things of that nature. But you can see clearly a big slowdown in the market saying bye-bye to that kind of free money, right? Now, getting into the debt ceiling, this is 2011. I want you to watch the little quick timeline here, right? So back then, they hit the U.S. debt limit, okay? Started doing the extraordinary measures. Then the House Republicans vote 234 to 190 to pass their cut cap and balance plan, right? Which, of course, the Republicans were going to, I mean, the Democrats weren't going to vote on, the president wasn't going to vote on. And then just a few days later, we end up getting a huge drop of 19% in 14 days, all right? So a uh, big drop there. Now you can see a couple of days later what happens. The U.S. House and Senate pass the debt ceiling bill, and then uh, President Obama signs it. Now, you skip forward to today, and what do you see? January, we hit the debt limit, uh, and then, of course, Treasury started going in extraordinary measures. Then you come over what happened at the end of April. House Republicans narrowly passed debt ceiling bill 217 to 215. Look how narrow that margin is, by the way. Okay, so check, check. Now, what we got to figure out is, how is the market going to react? Is it going to start to drop like we did in the last time before we get this done? Because right now, they aren't even close. They just delayed the talks Friday they're supposed to have, supposed to go into this week. But it, remember, times are different. Should, it, most likely, the odds are they will pass something, right? But as you can see there, they didn't have to wait to the last minute to do it, right? They didn't. That the market dropped before that. And so we're not going to wait because really they're talking about like June 1st. That's actually not true. It's like July 14th or something is the real date we would actually run out of money is what they're trying to say. And so it gives us a pushback. Same thing you saw in 2011. But the market has a way of pushing Congress in, into acting, right? Like, okay, if you want to act that way, we'll just sell off. And then uh, it's amazing how they go, we better get something done. Oh, my goodness. Like that's somehow, sometimes that happens. Okay, so pay attention to that. But what's really scary is look at the margin in the House the Republicans have, right? They're in control of the House, but they have a very slim margin. It's like one of the slimmest in history. And so, you know, all you need is a few of those people that held up Kevin McCarthy's uh, Speaker of the House vote to say, hey, I'm just going to hold on, hold on until I get what I want and keep pushing this thing down the road. So that's kind of the interesting and more scary part to look at. And I think that's why you're seeing uh, credit default swaps skyrocket on the one year and the five year when it comes to the treasuries, right? Because even they know this is a different kind of Congress than we've ever had. You got people that ever had no idea what they're doing, literally no qualifications. They don't even know uh, the rules, regulation, nothing. They're just up there to build a brand, get some clicks, build up, you know, fire up their base and feel good about themselves. They have no idea what they're doing. And a lot of them, unfortunately, don't know the ramifications of the game they're playing when they're playing chicken right now. 
It's not good for us. It does us no good. Okay, remember the debt ceiling isn't about new spending. It's about stuff we've already said we're going to spend on, right? So that's what that's about. It's not new spending. Okay, so keep that in mind. So that's one of the things the market, no doubt, is looking at. And should it get resolved? Yes. Do I trust these people ready to get it resolved until the, the wait's the eleventh hour? You know, probably not. I mean, they'll probably wait to the eleventh hour to get it done and panic everybody out. Now, the other one to watch carefully here. The dollar, you can see two strong bullish candles right there. You can see it's trying to work its way back up. It's probably 105 maybe. Now RSI is over 50, but if that happens, the market doesn't like it, okay? It does not like it one bit when that happens. You can just pull up an S&P chart over this and you'll see what I'm talking about. As when the dollar goes up, even though it's not gonna be very much, the market tends to sell off, so especially uh, tech. So keep that in mind. Now. The other one is obviously these regional banks. I mean, this chart to me shows you, and if it doesn't show you, I don't know what to tell you, how weak and just how, what a house of cards our banking system is literally built on, especially regional banks, right? I mean, this is the borrowing from the BTFP, right? And you can see it, I mean, 160 billion, 158 billion, another 140 billion, 140 billion. And it just goes to show you when you look at the rest of this, it's amazing of how weak or just how fragile the banking system actually is when you look at it overall, which why you know people say it's just not that good of a business. And why you see the top, like, I think it's the top 10 banks in the country or something own like 74% of the deposits now or something, which is absolutely mind boggling. But, you know, again, this is, and this has had something to do with, they came out with a update for lending from small to smaller companies and mid-sized companies. And guess what? The standards actually tighten more i say and that's not good it's another form of taking out liquidity out of the market so keep that in mind and if you're liking this video guys please hit that like and subscribe button that will be the thumbs up right below the video there just go ahead and hit that for me i sure do appreciate it and all your support and if you like this kind of content think about subscribing and so definitely let me know what you think about that in the comments now getting into the charts as you, you can see this week i mean we didn't go anywhere from like the high of the week to the low of the week i think it was like one half percent total or something and obviously just trading sideways while the RSI is telling us a different story than eh, might be heading over. And that's really what we got to figure out. You know, I mean, is this going to be one of those where we come back up again to this level and start to sell off again and maybe go back down to 3900 first? Hard to end up getting some kind of catalyst that finally starts moving us up. And one thing that could be is just all of the shorts in the market right now from the futures and everything else I've showed you. But again, what are you looking at here? Here's here's the VIX, about about a three month VIX average, and you can see the jaws are opened again, right? You get down this level in the VIX, which are down there on the bottom. That's the S&P at the top, and usually the jaws start to close, and you can see where we're at right now. And that's another reason you're seeing major hedging going on. We hadn't seen you know VIX call options jump this much in five years, so going back around 2017, 2018 time frame. Now here's the calls, and, you, and there's no reason about puts because I mean look how low it is. So and you can see the puts down at the bottom, but there's a reason why he's in a lot of hedging going on because I mean the risk of war is actually pretty dang good if you think about it, right? And then you go into the queues, which of course have been leading the way S and P sideways. Queues still just melting up slowly, right? There's that 2022 high anchored VWAP right there, which is good support. Uh, you see that volume node right there, so a lot of support right there around that 321 area. But again, this forever what feels like rising wedge right here. It's at the top right now. Right out of that, if it does break out, is that gap right there above it? And also right above that is the August highs. And so it's only, if I'm not mistaken, like three percent from the August highs the Qs are. So not a big move at all to get there. So it wouldn't surprise me one bit because people keep doing what? Piling into 10 stocks. That's that's just the way it is. Now, another way to look at this is if you're a bear, you're like, hey, wait a minute. There's the 100 weekly moving average support right there. There's a rejection in August on the 100. And now we're sitting right there at the 100. We'll press right up against it. And so that's what we got to see if we're going to reject off that again. Now, semiconductor has obviously been on fire. Micron has not, right? And when you look at this, you can see $64 is just like a brick wall. And, but it is slowly but surely moving up in this symmetrical wedge here. And so the question is, is it finally going to break out? RSI is like, eh, we're not really sure what's gonna be happening here. But if this one breaks out like AMD has, like Nvidia has, 
you know, watch out because obviously it's just going to add more fuel to the fire for semiconductors. But again, if you also look at it, it could just absolutely do a complete meltdown and rejection at 64 once again. Just watch the 64 level to see. Netflix, here's one of the top 10 and broke out and obviously room to run. That, that's what you got going on. So this will just contribute if it starts to continue this breakout to what's going on in those top 10 stocks and moving the queues up even farther, even though that gap is way up there. It had to move what is it, like 30 something percent before it even got to that gap? And so I can't imagine that, but just look for it more importantly, probably around the 400 area, somewhere in that, that range, if this breakout continues. And then Tesla, hard rejection off this trend line. Of course, what is that trend line? It was the one that will support for quite a while, right? If it continues to sell down, you see that gap fill right there. Uh, on the volume profile so it could go down to 164 where it hits you know really good support for it so let's keep that in mind still hadn't filled this gap going up all the way but there's the trend line you can see that absolutely gave it a hard rejection the other day again they said they hired a new ceo for twitter which will start in six weeks not six months my fault on that and i guess that just wasn't enough for the market right so nvidia obviously here it is this rising wedge has been going on forever and a day sitting there on the bottom trend line of it but again, we have all this consolidation below it, so good support below it. And again, the S and again, the RSI is telling us a different story. It's like, hey, this thing is going to have to start going down soon. But what are they waiting for? Probably earnings. Earnings aren't this week; they'll be next week, I believe, on the 24th. So keep that in mind because this one definitely could go for a ride down if those earnings don't live up to this crazy valuation it's got going on, right? And I've showed you what its 4P is, price to sales. It's just, it's out there, right? It's, it's doing what Tesla did in 2020, 2021, okay? Running off the, uh, like craziness. But we'll see because it's all about AI, AI, AI. There was a video about a uh, Google CEO the other day and it just it, it cut out and it clipped in like every time you said AI, it was like 173 times. It was ridiculous. But that's what you got to say, right? That's the new bubble that like, pumping up and bump, bubbles can go for a long time, right? And so we'll see. Now, this interview I told you about, you know, I told you, like, we know a long time ago when I was telling you guys about how, like, Robinhood, for example, they sell uh, our orders over to, like, Citadel, and so they can front run our orders because they know what we're doing, and then their machines will get in ahead of us, right? And so, on a bigger scale, this is what this gentleman is talking about, okay, and how the, the information is getting sold on, on these, about these bigger, larger companies, right? And so, and they make millions of dollars doing this. But it's crazy the number he uses. I mean, good Lord, pay attention to this real quick. It's really short. So our friend Joe Saluzzi over at Themis Trading, who co-wrote the book Broken Market several years ago, which literally was a precursor to Michael Lewis's Flash Boys, um, talking about IEX and kind of what's going on in the high-frequency trading world, and shame on me for not knowing what was happening. So there's this DTCC. It's the Depository Trust and Clearing Company. It's the largest depositor in the world. Basically, it's the broker's broker for people that don't know. We all have to go into it if you're trading. And that's where everything clears. It sits there. They match buyers and sellers, right? It's organized kind of chaos in a way. You know how much they process, guy, in in worth process dollars of securities? What do, what's the range you think they process a year? Four trillion dollars. Three quadrillion dollars. Stop, it's stop be, it. Stop it. Quadrillion. Yeah, that's right. Quadrillion. And I had to go look this up. I've heard the word, obviously, but never thought about it. And it is the one that's after trillion. Okay. So maybe our national debt will get to quadrillion one day. But instead of 12 zeros, it is 15 zeros. So that's amazing. And for those who are wondering what's after quadrillion, it is quintillion, sextillion, septillion. I mean, it's crazy though. 15 zeros, right? It's quite so just so people understand. So they have a lot of data. They have a lot of data. So I was always upset at high frequency trading and the exchanges and payment for order flow and data and speed shouldn't matter as far as trading and all this stuff. Little did I know. And and so Joe wrote this white paper, came out earlier this week, and the Wall Street Journal picked it up today and started asking questions. So they have these two products, equity kinetics and investor kinetics. One was introduced in 2018 and the other one in 2020. Why is the DTCC packaging data and selling it to HFT firms that are out there? Now, it's like, yeah, they sell their data. It's $56 million relative to the $2.2 billion they took in in revenue in 2022. But the point is, this: what gives them the right to do this? Yes, it's not a non-for-profit, but guess who owns this thing? All the banks. ICE. ICE is on the board. FINRA is on the board. Got JP Morgan, Barclays. Everybody's there. Why are they doing this? And let me tell you what it does. It gives you this equity kinetics product. I won't go too deep in this. 
gives daily snapshots in the 10 most active brokers by category, long only, hedge fund, high net worth brokers. And is it buying or is it selling and short selling? Yes, it doesn't say Guy Adami bought this, but what it does is it allows these trends to be picked up. So if you're a T row who commented on the article today, and they're obviously very upset, says they can pick up that they know it's a long only. They know that it's a name either that we've owned for a long time and they'll be able to tell, believe me, these AI machines, another use of it, are not dumb to figure out, oh, who can that be? It can only be one that they can narrow it down to four people. And then these guys front run. So what is the point of this data being packaged? Why does DTC have any, DTCC have any right to do this, to supplement what, all the members so they can make a little bit more money at the expense of everybody else? It's really wrong. It's wrong morally. And I want to know what the SEC thinks about this because, again, it's not a ton of money, but it's exposing a lot of people. And it's just, it's annoying, guy. Okay. And so, yeah, let me know what you think down in the comments because that is on a much larger scale than what obviously Robin Hood does with our, because I mean, obviously we don't buy anywhere near as much as a gigantic type hedge fund or whatever, but it also gives the banks on, and their uh, investment arms a huge advantage because, like you said, they can see the trends. They can see what the largest firms, the big money, is doing well ahead of things and front running, just like Citadel does with our orders, right? And so, again, it's a, about a fair market, a free market, this kind of stuff. Well, that's not a fair market because not everybody has access to that information. I guarantee you what he's talking about, that product, is not cheap at all. But the banks don't have to pay for it because they're sitting on the board, right? They already know what's going on, which is even crazier. Now, uh, a bunch of people keep asking me this. So I, I usually don't put this in the video, so I'll put it in there now. People say, what do you get for the membership and stuff? You sign up for that right there. It's, again, cheaper than McDonald's combo at $7.99. But I go through a boatload of stuff, right? You're going to have your members' videos every week. You got your morning news briefs, which has a boatload of information, more than you probably need. But I go through the max pain, the liquidity in the market, uh, what's going on with the breath and all that good stuff. As you can see right there, this is every single Monday, Monday, Monday through Friday. Then I break that back down into the max pain charts. Uh, and give you the details on what probably the range is going to be as far as market makers, market liquidity. This is what drives markets uh, in detail on that one. The recession watch, whatever's going on uh, to let us know we're actually going to go in a recession or not. Because we got a bunch of indicators saying we are, right? Uh, any kind of dark pool prints we need to be aware of, they act like magnets. Then you got the group where we go into trade ideas, things of that nature. And then my favorite part is the education section, which all the members share with each other. Uh, whether you're talking about chart analysis, investment questions, strategies, even kids finance. By the way, Warren Buffett has a YouTube uh, channel a long time ago. Uh, motivation, which I'm big on. And then, of course, great quotes, which I love. Put that one in there today about success. Uh, make sure you read that, by the way, if you're a member and you're in there. And it costs a whopping $7.99 a month. And still, even with inflation, still cheaper than McDonald's combo. So I try to keep it that way. And anyway, because I went there today. Yeah, I paid like $9.50 for still a combo. So still cheaper than Wendy's and Burger King, though. Keep that in mind uh, if you had to be going out somewhere. But anyway, let me know in the comments what you guys think about uh, any of that stuff right there. I really appreciate it. If you got anything out of it, hit that like and subscribe button for you guys. And I'll uh, come out with a video tomorrow setting us up for the week with earnings and Lord knows uh, how many Fed presidents are speaking this week? You'd be stunned. All right. So see you guys tomorrow.